good. Have your Bibles today. Luke's Gospel, 7th chapter. A few weeks ago, the ladies went to the mountains for a retreat. The theme of their retreat was the alabaster box. I can't remember what words were about that. But I want to talk about that, that uh, group of scriptures there where this lady comes in and anoints Jesus' feet. And uh, what it means to you and I today. You know, this event, though it's big for us today, when she did it, was called into dispute. The people that were around, the people that were there, the people that were knowledgeable, especially the Pharisee that lived in the house, all of them took exception to what she was doing. But the most incredible thing is the four words that Jesus uses to change her life. And those four words, the you know, uh, most people think that four words won't make any difference in your life at all. But, but what if the doctor walked in and says, I'm sorry, you have cancer. Those four words could shake you, couldn't it? What if he walked in and said, you're pregnant. <laughs> what if they walked in here today with a gun and said, you owe a thousand. What would you do? Just four words. Whose bed is this? Please take a number. The baby needs changed. Are we being audited? All of those are just four words, but the impact that it has on our minds and our hearts, the troubling thing that happens to us. Let's go over to this scripture today and let's take a look at what's going on. A Pharisee, just to give you a little historical background, the Pharisee was a, was a Jew, and, and you need to understand there are 12 tribes, okay? And so these 12 tribes of, of Jacob's descendants there that make up the uh, whole Israel, Jacob's name was turned, changed to Israel, and these children became the leaders of the 12 tribes. It's, it's an interesting pro progression of events. Uh, this is not working right. The sound is way back, feeding back up here, guys. And uh, so the Pharisees were, were a group of these people, and they were separated. Their beliefs and everything, they prayed more, they, they fasted more, they gave more, they, they just, they weren't, they wouldn't hang around you. They were like, a, uh, like the interior of our church today. And there would be just this group of people that sat over there. And if you weren't a separated one, a Pharisee, you couldn't sit over there. So there are just some things you wouldn't accept in your life, some things that you wouldn't allow to happen. They were big givers. They, they you know, uh, many times in the Bible where it talks about, and it's referring off of, referencing off of people that are doing this for the flesh, the Pharisee is the picture that we get. But the Pharisee was one that observed the Sabbath uh, to a greater degree than anybody. They were probably called the most orthodox of all the uh, Jewish uh, tribe there. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, understand these tables are not like ours with table and chairs. Uh, most of these tables are just very low, even to this day. That if you go into a Moroccan restaurant, you can usually find a very low table to go eat with your hands. Very characteristic of what Jesus was doing here. And uh, so he's there, he's kind of laying back on a pillow with his arm on here, with his legs behind him, just hanging out at this guy's house. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him to, saw this, he said to himself, now understand, he's not speaking out loud, he's saying this to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Verse number 40, Jesus answered him, who wasn't saying anything but just thinking it, 
Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, or 500 bucks, and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he canceled the debt for both of them. Now, which of them would you say loved more? Simon replied uh, that he loved more. Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me water for my feet. Now understand, hospitality meant they're, they're all work. You know, there's no concrete and asphalt road there. They're walking around on dirt. And they've got sandals, uh, closed-toed shoes really didn't come into existence for several hundred years after that. And, and so he's wearing his sandals, he's there. And uh, what happens, the first thing that happens, and him being a Pharisee, you would think this obligation would be right off the top. But somehow he must have been blown away that Jesus was coming to his house and forgot his manners. Because it said, you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. Understand that the glory of a woman is her hair. And it sounds kind of funny, but scripturally that's exactly what it says. You did not kiss me, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her the four words that changed her life for eternity, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I wonder this morning how far your faith would take you today. Your safe, your excuse me, your faith has saved you. You know, uh, are you in jeopardy today? Are you in a battle today? Yeah, as a Christian, where our lifeline or our dependency is not to the bank down the road. Our dependency is not to some treasure that we have, but our faith in Jesus is paramount, or the, or the most important thing in our entire life. But if you're of weak faith today, or little faith, the scripture says, you only have a little strength in your life. And so you're, you're probably like one of those bumper cars down at the, the amusement park where they're driving around, knocking into each other. You're just banging in here and banging in there. Instead of allowing God to take charge of your path, turn with me over to Psalm 91 just for a minute. Psalms 91. So it uh, first verse, whoever dwells in the, in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. That's hard to trust when you're going through a storm, but that's really where your faith should be the strongest. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers. Now this is a picture of a mother hen. David's writing this and he's, he, he's looking at the mother hen that protects her chicks against the, the hawk that would, would come. And that's what this allegorical uh, picture that we get here. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. And it's talking about war there, where the archer, you know, archery in, in the battle, they were the coveted person out of all the members that you had in the army. The archers were the most coveted, and they were the most expensive because they were shooting these sticks with feathers on them all the time. And those were very expensive to make. And so 
You had to be rich to go into battle. But the picture here is this, that you're not worried about shooting back because God's got you covered. Amen? That whether it's night or day, you know, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday, verse number seven, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked if you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the Most High your dwelling. No harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent because he loves me, saith the Lord. I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will, not, he will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. God says, I'm on this thing. I've got you covered. The angels of the Lord are not just sitting around playing harps and pinochle. The angels of the Lord are taking care of the saints of God. They're looking after us. God has commissioned them to watch over us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego couldn't see any angels when Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't bow down when you hear the music, bow down to my statue. If you don't bow down to my graven image, I'm going to throw you in the fire and you're going to be cooked. And so guess what they said? Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, we may burn, but we won't bow. Yeah. Imagine that chant. We may burn, but we won't bow. So they're going in. The soldiers are next to the furnace. He made it seven times hotter. It's, it, you know, it, it's blazing hot. And they throw them in, and the people that were near the front of that furnace, they died by the exposure. But those children of God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were in the furnace, and the king said, didn't we throw three in there? I see four, and one looks like the Son of God. How could he have discerned that, I wonder? And so when they came out, the only thing singed were the bonds that, that they were shackled with. The only thing Daniel came out with in, in, uh, when they rolled the stone away to see him lion's food down there, he said, you guys want a pillow? These guys are warm and cuddly. I've been here all night. The king, in every case, turns his heart to God. What happens to us is we don't have a very good testimony. The woman that walks into this house of the Pharisee has got a better testimony than probably anybody in that city because she comes to the Lord not expecting anything in return, just giving her love. It was an act this morning to pry your fingers away from that money to put it in the offering. How much should I give? <laughs> Do I tie it on the, on the, on the net or the gross? <laughs> what, what? I can't make up my mind. So we're there. We're frustrated. We're, we're battling with these things. Listen, if God was really your rescue and really your provider, you wouldn't worry about it at all. I don't go to bed at night worried about all this stuff. The worst thing that can happen is, I'll die. The worst thing that'll happen to me by dying is, I'll just get to his presence sooner. That's the worst that can happen to me. Or, you know, somebody could come and steal my car. I have insurance. Somebody could come and steal my treasures. Listen, they were somebody else's treasures before they were mine. Just pass them on down. I've given away more stuff than some of you have ever had in your life. And it just keeps coming to me. You know why? Because I am not a reservoir. I am a river. God can put stuff in me and flow to somebody else, and it will get there. 
God many times puts stuff in your hands and then somebody comes up. Have you ever been blessed with some money? And then somebody comes up and they ask you. It's incredible. They ask you for the exact amount. You're going, how do they know that? Well, listen, dumbbell. The reason why you got it was to give it away. But you say, no. What would they do with it? That's not the question. When God puts you in a position to bless somebody, just let it go. If they come up and, and supernaturally, you know, you just got last night because you played the lottery and you only got, uh, uh, you played the, the scratcher and you got $717. I really don't know if you could get that. But you got 717 bucks, and you walked into church this morning and somebody walked over next to you and talking to you and said, you know, I need $717 to pay my rent. How did they know? He was watching. Who helped you win? Now he's going to help you give it away. Because if you don't give it away, if you heard that old saying, it'll burn a hole in your pocket. It might burn more than that. What we've got to do is realize this stuff is important to God. The true story, there was a woman on an uh, on a overseas flight, and she, she's there, and she's feeling kind of uh, clammy, and, and her respiration, she's starting to breathe harder, and now she's got a pain in her, here and up here in her chin. It's coming down her arm, and she calls the flight attendant over. She says, I, I, I think I'm having a heart attack. Flight attendant asked the other attendant, go make an announcement on the, on the intercom and ask, is there a doctor on board? At that point, 67 doctors stood up. They were on a convention for cardiac specialists, and all of them were there. They all stood up in unison, and she says, is there anybody here that knows anything about the heart? And they just kept standing. Imagine the woman's glee as she looked over and saw all of those heart doctors there. They were ready. They were willing. They were able to effectively diagnose her problem, prescribe the correct treatment. They had the knowledge, the expertise, and the desire to take care of her and meet her needs. I want you to know this morning, our wonderful Lord and Savior steadily sees your needs and knows how to bring truth to you and wealth to you and blessing to you. You're only going to live as big as your faith. You'll only rise up as big as your faith. Your faith will only carry you so far. Some of you think getting that overtime and staying away from your family is the best blessing that you've ever had in your life. You know, I'm working over, I'm making more money today. And then you complain, they're taking all my taxes, all my, all my profits going in taxes. You know, when you were just making your 40 hours, you weren't complaining like that. But give you a little bit more, my, did that greedy spirit come in. See, God has the knowledge of what your condition is this morning. He knows where you're at. He knows your heart today. Where, uh, where are you in this story in this Pharisee's house? Are you one of the invited guests? Are you the Pharisee, the owner, and the one giving this meal? Are you the one bathing his feet with tears and, and perfume? Where, where do you fit in in our story this morning? Who are you? If we were to give you a part in the story, which one would you be? Are you the woman? Are you the man? Are you the second class citizen? Are you the one that they felt like didn't belong there anyway? See, though this woman has sin in her life, and it's important to, to know this. Though this woman has sin, and she's right there with Jesus, Jesus does not rat her off to everybody. He doesn't drop, he doesn't put a jacket on her. He doesn't, doesn't say, this is what she's guilty of, and blab the whole thing. You know what God does? He simply says, you're free. You're saved. What our problem is, is we like to... Once we get saved, then we go back and we start blurting out all of our sins. Can I tell you something? You shouldn't do that. 
You're just giving ammunition to hell. This is, this is going to be, this is enlightenment for some of you today. Like being there and you climbed the mountain, now you're sitting with that ball headed guy with a big belly and, the, and he's, oh, oh. Press up. Uh, Satan cannot read your mind, but God knows all things. Oh, Master, enlightenment. Problem is, we blab all the time, and hell's taking notation. You would be much better off just shutting up. I'll, I'll give you one of my points of life to live by. I have a list of things that I live by. This one is number five on my list of things to live by. If you don't want to be quoted, don't say it. What do you say? If you don't want to be quoted, don't say it. They said they wouldn't say anything. Yeah, but how many times have you broken that rule? You reap what you sow. It, it, it's sort of like the, you know, here you're working, you know, you're at work and you've got marriage problems. And so you're not going to God, you're going to the guy on the other side of the conveyor belt, you know, and you're, you're talking, you know, my husband and I, we're just not getting along. He said, yeah, I know, my wife and I, we don't get along either, you know. I, uh, it got really bad at our house, and, and she said, what did you do? And I got a divorce. I'm, I feel great today. And so here's the, here's the church lady standing there and said, oh, maybe I should get a divorce too. The party isn't telling you is. He has spousal support, three children that he's, he's supporting, and, and he's thinking about buying a plane to a foreign country to get out of this big mess. And all he had to do was keep his zipper zipped and his mouth shut. He'd have been just fine. But adultery is a sin. And you don't get blessed for that, folks. You, you get cursed. You get bound up with sin. See, this lady that's there, she knows she's a sinner. She was deeply convicted about her sin. She approached Jesus, not straight on, but from behind. If you're that woman today and you're guilty... You've done things. If we were to just have the big diamond vision that they have at Dodger Stadium, and better one at Angel Stadium if you're concerned about those things. But, uh, uh, all your sins are now broadcast on the big screen. All the things you've done. And it's really running in real time. So every evil thought you're thinking, boom, up it goes. Hey, Pastor Johnny, it's a sin to think thoughts? Well, this is the way Jesus said it. He says that if a man looks at a woman with lust in his heart, he's already committed the act. Man, some of you guys are busted. We just don't get it many times. We, we, don't, we don't get the whole story there. Look back at verse 39. Just a She's there in front of him. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus knows you. He knows your heart. He knows the people that betrayed your trust. He knows when they're, when they're not paying you what they said they would. He knows when you've been ripped off. He, he knows when they're lying about you. And you know, uh, some of you come from a blended family. And what I mean by that is you were married to someone else and, and uh, you got a divorce and now you're married to another person and that person has three kids and you've got three kids. And, uh, you two are in love, but the, those six are at war. And uh, you never really figured that this was going to happen, but it does all the time. It's because you can't just throw somebody into this mix and have them like it. Sin will cause disruptions in your life for most of your existence on earth unless you turn to God. 
And I've seen broken families. I've seen families that are messed up from the ground up, just totally whacked out. I've seen them put together because God's mercy bursts something. But when you try to do it on your own, when you, when you try to buy your way out and give them some token or some, some appeasement, you know, I'm going to take them to Disneyland or some other thing like that. I got news for you. It don't work. It just doesn't work. See, when, when Jesus is there in the Pharisee's house, he's looking at two people that are emotionally bankrupt. Both of them, the Pharisee who's acting like he's righteous and the woman who knows she's unrighteous. She is an absolute sinner and she knows it. He's a sinner but doesn't realize it. They're both bankrupt, literally. And Jesus says, I'm the debt for your bill. I, I, I pay it with my life. I gladly, I, I gladly put away this debt. I pay it off. I fulfill what the scripture says in Isaiah 53. That he's broken, he's torn up, he's beat down for us. The four words that will change your life are in verse number 48. Change anyone's life on this earth that come to Jesus Christ. You, you may have been the worst father, the worst husband, the worst son on planet earth. But when you come to Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Your past doesn't follow you anymore unless you allow it to. And one way that you can allow it to is come to this altar, confess that you need Jesus Christ. You definitely can't list all your sins. But confess to Jesus Christ, you're a sinner. You ask for forgiveness. He cleanses you that day. You get up from there, and then you go back, and you try to explain what happened to you. I got news for you. Those people that thought you were weird and ugly, cantankerous, a liar, a drunkard, and all that, it's going to take them some time to see who you really are. God sees you as you are, free from sin, but the world is not God. I've told you the two things that I've learned in life. One, there is a God. And two, we're not Him. We don't see as God sees. We, we don't see the change on the inside. We don't see the sins that are forgiven. When you're forgiven, it happens right then. Instantaneously, it's God. And you want to go back, and it's sort of like, you know, that scripture that says, when you know there's somebody with odd against you, lay your gift down, go over, settle a thing up, and come back. Yeah. Well, you can get so involved in confessing different stuff, you can bring up stuff they didn't even know about when you're over there. It's a simple matter of just going to the person and saying, listen, I, I had my foot, my ankle, my left arm in my mouth, I was just inside out. I don't know what was wrong me, with me. I just, you know, uh, I had brain gas or something. I was sinning. I lied. I cheated. I, I'm sorry. I ask your forgiveness. And listen, if they don't give you forgiveness, it doesn't matter because it's not their forgiveness is not what cleanses you. Your job is to confess. Their job is to forgive. And when they don't, They'll live in that quagmire of anger and bitterness and everything else. Bitterness will ruin the marrow of your bones, make you sick inside and out. It could give you any kind of sickness. We look at the Bible and we're going through all of these things that are here. We find case after case where people are sick, they're, they're, they're rotten with sin. Every evil thing is going around them, you know. And sin doesn't always make you sick, but it can. But I can tell you this, sin always brings you into bondage. And it's the bondage of a selfish nature. You might be a very rich person, but very poor on the inside. Having wealth does not bring happiness. And you can go by the sign, bless this happy home and have holes all around it with broken plates on the floor. From how happy it was last night as you were in your World War III. Because it does not bring happiness. To get happiness in your life, you're going to have to give up your flesh. Surrender your will. We don't like to do that. We like to be in the union in, in, in church. We, when, when I got saved, I joined God's union. 
You know, I was hired. I, I don't clean floors and I, I don't wash dishes. I don't make beds either. But I'll be a Christian if I have to. What do I need to do? Being a Christian means you just join the army of servanthood. He that will be Lord of all will be servant of all. And what does a servant do? Serves. How do they serve? They don't have a honey-do list is one way they do it. Because they're doing this stuff all the time. There's no list. There may be one that, honey, can you do this? Sure, babe, I can do that. I'll get right to it. With, you know, at halftime, I'll get to I'll get. I'll be right. Be over. Be, I'll, I'm there for you, babe. The only question is, is which game halftime? The all-day thing or just the next halftime? Because we're like that. We're like that. We procrastinate. We just put it off. And so what happens to us is this. We begin to break these, these ties that are called our vows of holy matrimony. We begin to break them, and so we're, we're, we're together as one. And so little by little, it's like tearing two pieces of paper apart. This is what marriage is, why it hurts so bad. When you start tearing apart, it's not a clean tear. You're stuck together. You're meant to be one sheet of paper, and you start peeling it apart. This piece gets there. You got holes there, tears there. It's all messed up. Because it was never meant to be torn up. And you've got to realize that when you're going in. I talked to a guy one day. He, he wanted me to pre perform this wedding ceremony. And so I'm just talking to him by himself. And he, and he dropped the dime on himself. He said, you know, I figured I'm going to be married to her about seven years. I said, then, so what do you turn into then? A grapefruit or what? <laughs> no, no, no. That, I'll be, I, will, I will have taken care of her needs and... If you're taking care of mine, I'll just go to a prettier girl, or you know, maybe I'll marry somebody rich or something. And I said, Sir, I want you to walk out of my office right now while you still can. Because I think you're about the dumbest guy I've met all week. <laughs> Vows of holy matrimony are sanctified by God, not by man. Man is not the one who created marriage, God is. God says, when you, when you two come together, and here's Joseph and Mary, they're in their betrothal time. The, the two years of acting like marriage, but no sex. You don't sleep together. You act like you're betrothed. You do everything like you're married. You prove to her family, and, and during that period of time, they're bringing their dowry, they're making up all of that thing, but you prove that you can take care of, of, of your wife. And so all of this comes together. We throw that away. You, know, you meet her in the morning and marry her at noontime, you know. Uh, I know a guy, he, he helped some lady move from, from out of state. and He wasn't married when he left to help her. And lo and behold, if he didn't come into my house and I'm taking a nap on the sofa, and Patty comes over and says, hey, I got a surprise for you. And he walks over and shows me his Las Vegas marriage license. Um, I said, is that real? Tell me it's not real. It was real. I said, oh, God, help him. What, what could you have been thinking? You don't know who she is. I know who she is. I counseled her with her first husband, the one with the butcher knife, Mark. I, I counseled her after she got out of jail. I counseled him. You don't understand. Don't go to sleep if she's still awake. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You really don't want to do that. She can do almost anything to you. Oh, man, he started shaking. Can I get out of this? How, how do I make this void? I said, no, you're in it for the whole ride. <laughs> yeah, boy. Little boy had just gotten saved and sat on a bench next to an old man who looked upset. Little boy said to the man, Sir, do you need to get saved? The man startled and said abruptly, I'll have you to know I've been an usher in the church for over 30 years. 
And I've been the head usher for 15 years. The little boy responded, sir, it don't matter what you've done. Jesus can still save you. <laughs> yeah. Salvation. Victory. Our lives. James Garfield was a lay preacher and the principal of a school. He, was, he belonged as the principal of the dean of a denominational college. They said he was ambidextrous, meaning he's just as good with his right hand as he was with his left hand, and he could simultaneously write Greek in this hand and Latin in this. I mean, I can't, I, I have a hard time eating with two hands. I still just try to do it with one, and sometimes I miss then. But in 1880, he was elected president of the United States. But after only six months in office, he was shot in the back with a revolver. He never lost consciousness. At the hospital, the doctor probed the wound with his finger to try to find the bullet, but to no avail. Today, we know it went through his vertebrae, lodged between his spleen and his pancreas. But the doctor couldn't find it, so he tried a silver-tipped probe. Still, he couldn't find or locate the bullet. Garfield's body simply wouldn't give it up. They took Garfield back to Washington, D.C., despite the summer heat. They tried to make him as comfortable as they could. He was growing weaker and weaker every day. Teams of doctors tried to locate the bullet, probing the wound over and over. In desperation, they asked Alexander Graham Bell, who was, the, who was working on a little known device at the time called the telephone, to see if he could locate the metal inside the president's body. He came, he sought, he too failed. The president hung on through July, through August, but in September he finally died, not from the wound, but from the infection of those doctors sticking their fingers in his side. The repeated probing with the physician killed him. So it is with people who dwell too long on their sin. They refuse to release it to God, and so they just keep poking it, poking it, poking it, poking it. How many of you have a scar this morning? A scar is your flesh healing up your wound. I, I have a couple, a fairly big one right there. I don't know if you could see it, but it's kind of big. You know, it usually doesn't bother me until I start going like this. And pretty soon I can make that thing so irritated, I have to go to the doctor and get a shot. Now it was fine until I started picking at it, probing at it, pushing on it, gouging it. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just go on. Go on. Just go on. Because when you can't go on, it's going to be an anchor to your life. You're never going to get past it. Some of you have done some things to, to your family. You've violated their trust. You've wounded in such a deep manner that you think you can never be forgiven and you can never work off what you've done. I would say to you today, your sins are forgiven. You're here today and you made bad choices with your heart. You were so, so engrossed. You fell in love over a bowl of cereal. But it's been rocky road from then on. Because infatuation will not last for long until you dream about something else or want something else. There's only one way that we can resolve our differences. That is to forgive. There's some people in this building. You are the unforgiven chosen. You believe it's your gift in life to hold unforgiveness tight. So no one ever forget about unforgiveness because you, you're quick to blame them. You're quick to remind people. You're you're there, and you, you love to pray over them, and so you walk over here. Let me pray for you, brother or sister. Father, forgive them for the adultery, God. Lord, for their lying, cheating. God, you know the things that they've done. They've been in prison. 
Lord, when they got out, they went back in because they couldn't uh, accept freedom, and they just, they're just stupid, God. But I know, Lord, they're saved today, God. So I ask you, Lord, heal this headache that they have, Lord, and just make them feel better. You, you just did a character assassination. You just gossiped, and God says to, to put you in with the murderers and the whoremongers and the revilers. You fit in that bag. Do you understand that? God rates the gossiper the same way he does a murderer. You're on the same level. You, you think you're clean because it's just your mouth. I've got news for you. Verbal bullets hurt too. Whoever said sticks and stones may break your bones and... Words will never hurt you. Didn't have a bone in their body. Is this an absolute lie? It's an absolute lie. The next time your wife gets something, she comes home from the ball, tries it on, and she walks in. Honey, what do you think? Tell her what you're really thinking. See if you get any cooked food in this decade. You say you say that stuff. You're th I, honey. I don't even care about dress. I don't care the color. I don't. I, I don't care what sleeves they got. If they're puffy or straight, I don't. I don't. I don't will you just wear the thing? If some of you were, were you, you get more turned on by a toolbox. Your problem, your problem is you've just never engaged in a spiritual way. God loves everything to just celebrate. The sun comes up. Let's see you stand and face the sun when it comes up. Blows your eyes out the back of your head. You know what? I mean, it is powerful. Is it any wonder we celebrate, uh, we, we try to locate Jesus' birthday and have a celebration? You know, the... You know, God hasn't killed anybody over an Easter egg hunt or a chocolate Easter bunny. I don't know how the eggs and the bunnies get together except for fertility. <laughs> you're, you're, you're propagating babies like a rabbit. And that's where that term came from. But what happens to us a lot of times is we just don't think about what he's done for us. So this is what I want you to do right now. I want you to stand up. February 21st, 2005, just days after the head-on crash that killed their three sons, Nathan and Connie Backstrom did something most people consider remarkable. They forgave the person responsible. Matthew, Jacob, and Justin, their sons, died when a 22-year-old drinking driver searching for a number on his cell phone went across the lanes of traffic and hit them head on. This young man has consequences for his actions and so I can forgive him because my God has forgiven me. It is my duty as a Christian, I can't live the rest of my life carrying that anger against this boy. Those 67 doctors that were on that plane it wasn't that they were all cardiac specialists, but would they get involved with the woman? And they did. They elected one of the 67 to go treat her because all 67 couldn't do it. Sometimes we can have a whole crowd and they can look impressive, but most of the time, God is just one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes in our shower, sometimes in our car. I'm just walking the dog around the block, sometimes in a place just like this. What's got your life? What's gripping you today? What sin have you committed that has branded you and marked you in your mind today? That's the one that God says, you are forgiven. Forgiven. You are forgiven. You. 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 Whatever you've done. You may have called your kid a name and all of their life they've, they've thought that's the name you've called. They've told everybody. My 
mom told me I was stupid. It may have been one time, but on that moment, it marked that child. That act of sin that you committed, you can never live down because it's no longer yours. The Bible says this in the book of Romans, live as much as you can, as peaceably as you can with everybody. But I can't make you like me. And you can't make me like you. It has to be something that God gives us. Amen? So we're going to pray together right now. Reach over and take somebody by the hand. If you're not saved this morning, we're going to pray a prayer. If you ask God in your heart right now, he's going to save you right now. If you're backslidden in your heart, if you were to die right now, you don't know whether you'd make heaven your home or not. I can tell you, you need to be a part of this prayer. But some of you are labeled today. Some of you are labeled unlovable. Some of you, you, you work in your home and you wash the dishes, you make the bed. Nobody ever says even thank you anymore. Thanksgiving wasn't about you at all. It was about some football game and hurry up and get it cooked so we can eat. Nobody helped put away anything. Nobody even mentioned the work that you did. God saw everything. And he wants to honor you and bless you. If you, you go to work and you're, you're, you're in a situation where it's like you're, you're digging in sand. No, no matter how much money you bring home, it seems like it just caves in and caves in. And you never have anything for yourself. And so now you're resenting that you have to go to work and nobody else is making a sacrifice. And that's at least the way it looks to you. But listen to me. A 12-year-old boy and a 10-year-old girl can't go get a job. And your wife, she may not, may have a handicap and she can't go get a job. And so get off of the cross and let Jesus who died for you, let him do what he's supposed to do. And just realize this, this won't last forever if you will trust God. He'll get you a promotion. He'll get you a pay rate. He'll get you through this right now. If you're you're watching this service this morning, I want you right where you're at. You're alone. Just put your hands over your heart right now. Let's pray this prayer right now. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, I ask you, Lord God, to forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus left heaven, lived on earth, and was crucified. He died and he rose again to show me that I can die to my sin and raise up a new creature. I claim freedom today from my past by the blood of Jesus Christ. I renounce bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, treachery, lying, stealing, all the things that have betrayed my trust. I forgive all of those that have done these things. I forgive my family. I forgive my friends. I forgive my church. And I forgive myself. I am free today in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, fill me. Engage my life with the Word of God. Show me what I was created for. Guide my footsteps. Father, I ask to send holy angels to guide my path, protect my family, and to take care of my home. From this day forward, I let it go. I claim salvation and healing of my mind, my soul, and my flesh. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to turn around with somebody right now. Just turn around and say this. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. You're forgiven today. Don't, don't walk around with your head down. Don't walk around trying to justify and get out of the habit of saying I'm sorry all the time. I'm not sorry that Christ died for me. Though when we read the scripture in Isaiah 53rd chapter, it sounds like the people that were there were sorry that he had to die. I'm not sorry because it was the plan. 
God got a plan for your life. A plan to bless you. Amen. I love you today. God bless you. Have a great day.